that, I fear, is rather a hard act to follow. Mr. Chancellor, as public orator, may I present Professor Sir Peter Bell, a candidate for a distinguished honorary fellowship. To be a distinguished honorary fellow, to wear what one irreverent earlier recipient has described as a plums and custard dressing gown, <laughs> is to receive the highest honor that this university can confer. It is a title limited to 24 members who have already merited an honorary degree for their achievements and who have an outstanding record of service to this university. Peter Bell has undoubtedly earned his place in that illustrious fellowship. Peter was one of the cohort of talented clinicians recruited in the early 1970s to take part as foundation professors in the adventure which was the new Leicester Medical School. He was educated at Sheffield and held a lectureship in surgery at Glasgow University under his mentor, Sir Andrew Kay. When he came to Leicester in 1973, at the tender age of 34, he was one of the rising stars of surgery. By that stage, he had already made his name in the relatively novel fields of vascular surgery and organ transplantation, and the department he created at Leicester continued that pioneering work, establishing a reputation for vascular research, which continues to this day. At the same time, the department trained generations of medical students in the skills necessary for all doctors, whether or not they later became specialist surgeons. Research and teaching are not the whole of the story. For all clinical academics, then as now, service provision, that is, caring for real patients, is a large part of the work. Peter says that being knocked down by a car in Sweden and almost killed gave him a valuable insight into what patients have to suffer. It is certainly the case that his greatest satisfaction has come, quite simply, from helping his patients to get better and finding new and better ways of doing it. One of the many patients he treated, as we have now heard, was the mother of our other older and today, George Davis. It may not be appreciated now, but before the establishment of the medical school in Leicester just over 40 years ago, Medical provision here was regarded as seriously under-resourced, and one of the reasons for funding the new school was the need to raise standards in the area. The expertise brought to Leicester by Peter Bell and the surgeons he led in the university and in the local hospitals was a crucial component in the modernization of surgical provision and the improvement of outcomes in this area. Leicester was fortunate that Peter Bell was not lured away to other distinguished posts and that he stayed with us here for 40 years, ensuring the continued growth of his department and the training of numerous excellent surgical clinical scientists, an aspect of his career of which he is rightly proud. His achievements have also been widely recognized elsewhere. He has some 700 publications to his name on vascular disease, transplantation, and cancer in medical and surgical journals. Among the many other indications of his standing, he was president of the Surgical Research Society and of the European Society of Vascular Surgery. He was one of the founding members of the Academy of Medical Sciences and was vice president of the Royal College of Surgeons from 2001 to 2004. He was knighted in 2002 and awarded the honorary degree of Doctor of Science here in 2003. Few people in recent times have done more to improve the general standards of vascular surgery and fewer still to, to improve the quality of surgical treatment in our area. Retirement has given Peter more opportunities for things which may have suffered during his exceptionally busy professional career. Playing lawn bowls, listening to traditional jazz, cooking Indian meals and above all spending more time with his family but retirement has not meant withdrawing from public life. In particular, Peter has supported medical research charities like the Circulation Foundation, of which he is a patron, and George Davis is also a supporter, and our own local Hope Against Cancer, of which P Peter has been a president. His continued interest in the advancement of vascular surgery 
and his wholehearted commitment to the success of this university and of its medical school are what entitle him to the recognition and the thanks which the university gives him today. Mr. Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and the Council, I present Peter Robert Frank Bell that you may appoint him Distinguished Honorary Fellow of the University of Leicester. Lord Lieutenant, Sheriff, guests. My mother told me many years ago that I was to do surgery. I was four years old at the time. I didn't understand what she meant, but I know now. And she also wanted me to be a professor, so she named me P.R. She forgot the O. F. That's the mistake she made. Now, I came to Leicester in 1974. Most of you weren't born then, I guess. Um, and uh, somebody called Mrs. Thatcher, who you may have heard of, she was the education secretary who announced three new medical schools, Southampton, Nottingham, and Leicester. And I saw this job advertised, and I thought, well, that's a good position to look at. It was a good university. It had many international departments, molecular biology, chemistry, space science. And it was a new place to go where I could not make any mistakes really and follow somebody else and try and build up the department to become what I hope it now has become. So when I came here in 1974, it wasn't quite like that actually. <laughs> Unbeknown to me, there was a financial crisis brewing and again, you won't all remember this, but there was rubbish in the streets. Most people were on strike. There were intermittent power cuts and the International Monetary Fund were knocking on the door. And the medical school was almost cancelled. Most of you won't know that, so you wouldn't have been here except that somehow the university and other people managed to avoid that happening. I think it was because it would be more expensive to close it down because of all the appointments and the buildings, and so it went ahead. So you should be thankful for that. Uh, now, being a, a doctor, as some of you will be, has special, uh, special in many ways, because you meet people you wouldn't otherwise meet. And I met George Davis that way, which was fortunate, because although the medical school went on, we had to cut our funding. We had no money. Nottingham and Southampton were well funded. We had hardly any funding at all. And that's one of the reasons, as you heard, why the University the Leicester Medical School came here, because of the poor resources that existed here. I'll give you an idea of how the change has occurred. When I first came here, there were 10, I think, orthopedic surgeons, maybe less, maybe five. There are now 40 uh, or more. So you can see how under-resourced they were. Now, in the middle of all that, research, of course, came very much last and there was no money for research. And that's where George came in. One day I was on call, and by pure chance, in came George with his mother. I didn't know who he was. And his mother had an ischemic leg, a leg with a poor circulation, which goes gangrenous eventually. I couldn't save his leg, but she got better. But she always announced me as the man who cut her leg off, which is a bit... <laughs> a bit uh, it, uh, awakening for me. Anyway, George then said, I'd like to help with your research. And uh, that's what he's done ever since. He's been a fantastically supportive person. And in the end, you've seen what happened recently. And it allowed us to do things we could not have done without George. I'd like to thank you, George, for all the support you've given us over the years. We wouldn't have been where we are otherwise. But having no resources in Leicester meant that people, it was a long waiting list, no one got anything done, and they went privately, or they went to London. And my next door neighbor said to me once, when I'd been here about a year, he said, well, when you've been here for a year or two, and you've had some experience, I suppose you'll go to Harley Street. I said, I wouldn't go to Harley Street, and I was unconscious, he said, and that was, that's true, because people think it's an amazing place to go, but it's not actually. You just need to have money, that's all. 
The other thing I had to do when I came here was uh, to organize the curriculum. There wasn't a curriculum. And uh, I was in charge of the first two years, which was mainly anatomy, biology, and that kind of thing at that time. And we were trying a new thing in Leicester called Man in Society. Now, I suppose nowadays that would be man and woman in society, otherwise there'd be problems with that. And uh, this was a new idea altogether. This was because before this time there was no GP teaching. There was no teaching about communication skills. And most of you have been involved with doctors who don't talk to you properly, who don't understand what they're saying. And that's a lesson to learn. And this idea was to try and make them talk in a better way to their patients. And of course, it was a good idea too, because most people think it's intuitive. People talk to patients normally anyway. They don't, you know. And as, 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 uh, as I was you were told earlier on, I was knocked down by a car some time ago, uh, and I was in hospital quite a lot, I had various operations, and um, I learned from that experience. It's true what they say. The food is terrible. It's always the wrong thing you, you haven't ordered that you get. Uh, the tea lady is your best friend, no question about it. She comes in and talks to you, and, tell, and talks to you about normal things. The doctors come along and stand in groups at the bottom of your bed, whispering to one another about you. And then if you're lucky, one of them comes on his own and says something to you, which is complete lies. And, and, you, and they go away and you think, what the hell was that all about? So don't do that, try and avoid that. And I think, in fact, I, I would suggest to the, the, the dean that um, the medical curriculum should be changed to include students doing two weeks as a patient. I don't think you should run over by a car, first of all, but I think you should certainly have a week or two as a patient. You learn from that exactly what you should and shouldn't do. When you speak to patients, remember, a number of things. Don't ever tell them there's nothing wrong with you. There is something wrong with them. They know it, they've told you. It may be psychological, but they've told you. Don't say that. And I'll tell you a little story, which is an um, example of that. My wife down on a holiday somewhere in Cornwall, and we got talking to a young couple who were involved at that time in Carnaby Street, which is all the 60s, miniskirts and so on. And I never tell anybody on, on holiday what I do. I always say I'm in drains, and that always keeps them quiet. Well, she said, um, I don't like doctors, she said. And I said, well, why not? She said, well, she was about 25 or 26. I had chest pain, she said, and uh, I went to all these doctors in Harley Street <laughs> and had all these expensive tests done privately, and they said, there's nothing wrong with you. But I knew there was something wrong with me. So I went to a spiritualist. And I went inside and she had this big glass dome and she asked me a few questions, turned it around and she had the answer. I said, really? Do you know what it was all the time? It was my left ear, she said. I had an infection in my left ear. And there's a, there's a nerve which goes from your ear, down here, across your chest, down to your tummy. And I thought it was my heart all the time. It wasn't my heart. So she gave me some drops, which cost me a lot of money, I have to say. And she said, put these in your ear at exactly nine o'clock in the morning, not a minute sooner, not a minute later. I won't be responsible if you do. At 12 o'clock and at three o'clock. And you know, within three weeks, my pain had gone completely. So that's what you do. You don't tell lies, but you don't say there's nothing wrong with the patient, ever, whatever you do. So that's the first thing I would tell you. The second thing is, congratulations on passing your degrees. It's been hard work, I know, and you'll come across lots of problems in your career when you'll be uncertain of yourself and you won't know what to do. My particular problem arrived once when I had to say a patient was dead the first time. That was pretty awful, really. Uh, and, and I kept on, uh, the nurse would say the patient's dead, doctor, and I said, well, I'm not sure, really. Uh, and I'm not certain, so he'd take his blood pressure, look in his eyes, take his pulse, nothing of course, and he'd say, 
Well, can I send them down to the morgue? No, I'm not, not sure. I'll come back in an hour or so and, and, and see. Well, you may laugh, but it's true, you wait. <laughs> and, then, and then they say, they come back in an hour or so, and, and they say, well, can I? No, I'm not quite sure yet, but the arms are stiff. Look, they're stiff now. And eventually, after about three hours, I said, OK, that's fine. This is not a, a, a completely untrue tale, because in Leicester here, some not too long ago, there was a, a fr not a friend of ours, but a lady along the road who died. The GP came and visited her and uh, took her pulse, obviously, quite quickly. And she was sent away to the undertakers. And um, the undertaker was speaking to the relatives in, in hushed tones. And the, uh, not the consultant undertaker, but the, the junior undertaker came and said, excuse me, excuse me. He said, stop, stop it. I'm talking to the relatives. Can't you see what I'm doing? But, 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 said, go away and do something else. But she's alive. <laughs> what do you mean she's alive? She's alive. Well, how do you know that? She said, well, I was pushing some cotton wool up her bottom, as you normally do, apparently. <laughs> and she said, stop doing that. <laughs> so I knew she was alive. And she was admitted to the intensive care unit, and it said on the top of the form, admission from undertakers. <laughs> and she actually survived and did very well in the long term. So remember those little traps that might be there, to, but always do the best you can. And as George said earlier on, the NHS is well worth trying to save. It's in your hands now. People talk about it and say that it's bad. And so it's not bad at all. It's, it's, most of it's fantastic. You only hear about the bad things. And I always say to people who I see who are complaining, then write a letter and complain. But the ones who have a good time, they never say anything, of course. That's the problem. 90% say nothing. And I always tell those people to write and say what a good time you had. But they never do. So try and remember that. Work hard in the service. Speak to your patients properly. Remember what I said to you about whispering in corners. And also, listen to your patients. Don't just ignore them and do what you want. You listen to what they've got to say. It is difficult sometimes, but you've got to do it properly. And then do some research. Research, you think, is a, well, it's a boring thing to do. and so It's not at all. It's a fantastic thing to do. You'll see changes all the time. You'll make changes. You'll make, make the treatments you're giving better. That's what you must do. And the future is in research, which is what George said. And that's why he funds it, because he knows and I know that you have to do research to take things forward. Don't just do your job and forget about it. It's easy to do that, because research is hard work. It's very hard work. Talk to your patients. Remember that it's a great honor looking after patients. They trust in you, and they tell you things they wouldn't tell anybody else. So honor that, that, that knowledge that they give you. Don't tell anybody else about it. And most of all, respect them, as George has said, Treat everybody the same. Don't treat certain people like this and those down here like that. Treat them all the same, and you'll do very well in life. Thank you very much.